One of my favorite things to show students is how we get this protein all the way to something like this, a skeletal muscle that we may want to strengthen and enlarge. And I actually don't think we give our digestive system enough credit for all the steps that are necessary to break down the protein, absorb it into the bloodstream, and get it to the actual muscle. So today, we're going to go on a little journey through the digestive tract to show what it really takes to get that protein from mouth to muscle, which will then help us to understand if it even matters what type of protein we ingest, do we have any control of where that protein actually goes in our body, and even get into some recommendations on when to eat or ingest that protein, as well as the overall amount. So let's do this. As we start our story with protein, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind. Two words actually, digestion versus absorption. With digestion, we are talking about the breaking down of the food into smaller molecules. Then those smaller molecules can later be absorbed. And with absorption, we're talking about those smaller molecules actually being absorbed into the bloodstream. And what we're gonna see is that certain segments of the digestive tract are primarily going to be dealing with digestion and other segments are primarily going to be dealing with absorption. This concept doesn't completely exist in a vacuum. For example, digestion begins here in the oral cavity that you can see I'm tracing with the probe. This is done mechanically with chewing and even chemically with enzymes that are released from salivary glands. But there is some ability to absorb a few smaller, simpler substances in the mouth, such as sublingual medications, sublingual glucose. But again, digestion is primarily going to be taking place here in the oral cavity or the mouth through chewing in saliva. Now, in the case of say like a protein shake, there's not much chewing going on there because we usually just drink that down. However, if you are eating something with protein in it like chicken or steak or some other food, you're obviously going to be doing more chewing or mechanical digestion in that case. But in either example, when we take that food from the oral cavity and swallow it down, it will move down the food tube or the esophagus and in to the stomach. Now, this is a really cool dissection that we've removed from another body, but the stomach is actually in the left upper quadrant, which you can see in this other cadaver dissection, but we've removed it over here so you can see it a little bit better. And what's really cool with comparing this stomach, this stomach we haven't cut into, but if I show you this one, look how cool this stomach dissection is. I can actually turn it inside out to show you what the inside lining looks like. And this inside lining is very cool looking, obviously, but it's called the tunica mucosa. And you can see these awesome folds called gastric rugi, which allows the stomach to stretch when you fill it up with a whole bunch of food or protein in today's story. But also this tunica mucosa has various cells that secrete mucus to protect the stomach. Other cells called parietal cells will secrete hydrochloric acid. And the hydrochloric acid will kill pathogens and also denature proteins which is part of this process of digesting that protein we just in ingested. That hydrochloric acid also converts something called pepsinogen into pepsin. This is important because other cells in the tunica mucosa of the stomach, called chief cells, secrete the pepsinogen, and once the pepsinogen comes in contact with the hydrochloric acid, it gets converted into its active form, pepsin. And pepsin is an enzyme that also breaks down the proteins that we just ingested. So based on this, the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin denaturing and breaking down the proteins, we can see that the stomach is still also primarily going to be participating in digestion, chemically through the use of acid and enzymes, and mechanically digesting by churning and mixing that food all together. And once that food gets mixed together with the stomach juices, we call it chyme. Now again, like the mouth, some things can be absorbed through the stomach, such as certain medications, even a little alcohol and fluids, but primarily we're dealing with digestion here and the protein still needs to move further downstream before it can be absorbed. And at the end of the stomach, there's this really important sphincter that you can see I'm pinching here. You can see it's a little bit more thick in the wall of the stomach here, and this is called the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter will regulate how much food can move out of the stomach and into the small intestine. And how long it takes for the food to move from the stomach and into the small intestine through this pyloric sphincter is dependent on the amount and type of food that you've ingested. In general, really fatty foods will take longer to break down in the stomach and therefore take longer to pass into the small intestine. Whereas a very simple protein powder like whey protein, especially if that's all that you ingested or maybe even if you ingested it with a few simple carbohydrates, that can all be mixed together and go through this initial process of digestion fairly quickly. 
and we'll move from the stomach and into that small intestine in a shorter amount of time. Now once we're in the small intestine, we're going to find that it's broken down into three different segments. The duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. The first segment, the duodenum, actually means 12 because it's about the width of 12 fingers. Now most names in anatomy make a lot of sense, but this is one of those names where I just kind of wonder how the anatomists of old came up with it. I just imagine this group of anatomists circled around a cadaver trying to decide what to name this part of the small intestine and one of those anatomists just randomly walks up and is like, hmm, four, eight, twelve, duodenum, it's a great name. I know I digress a little bit here, but the important thing for us to note is that the duodenum connects with the common bile duct. And this common bile duct receives bile from the liver and the gallbladder, as well as secretions from the pancreas, which includes bicarbonate as well as pancreatic enzymes. The bile from the liver and the gallbladder is used to break down fats, which we aren't quite as focused on in this story because we're mostly focusing on protein. And the bicarbonate from the pancreas is also a little bit of an FYI, as this helps to neutralize the acidic mixtures that are coming from the stomach. But the pancreas releases several enzymes that will further break down and digest proteins. So in the first part of the small intestine, this duodenum, we are still breaking down and digesting the protein. But after these final steps of digestion in the duodenum, we can now finally start to absorb. However, we do need to take a second to talk about something very important when it comes to the absorption of digested proteins and getting those to our muscles. And this is the important distinction between proteins, peptides, and amino acids. Now, if you've spent much time thinking about protein and building muscle, you may have also thought about testosterone and its contribution to building muscle. But sometimes testosterone contributes to other things. Like in some of us, testosterone can be converted to dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, at the hair follicles of the scalp. And this is one of the factors that can result in hair loss. Luckily, there are some things that we can do to help with hair loss, like the sponsor of today's video, iRestore. iRestore makes this nifty little piece of technology called the iRestore Elite device. And this has been shown to be an effective option for hair loss. There are a lot of low-level laser therapy devices out there, but the reason I prefer this device compared to others on the market is due to its quality and enhanced coverage of the scalp. It uses Lumitech technology that consists of 500 medical grade lasers and LEDs. And because it uses both lasers and LEDs, you get more uniform coverage and thorough treatment of all of the hair follicles. It is also FDA cleared and is a medication free option to help with hair loss. And as I've mentioned, has been clinically shown to help support hair growth. It only needs to be used for 12 minutes a day and the triple wavelength power ensures deeper and more effective treatment that can help enhance cellular metabolism on the scalp, improve blood flow and reduce inflammation which are factors that contribute to hair growth. iRestore also wants you to be completely satisfied with your purchase. So if you aren't 100% satisfied with your results, they have a 12 month money back guarantee. So if you're interested, visit the link on screen and use our coupon code IOHA to get $625 off the iRestore Elite device. We'll also include that information in the description below. So back to this important distinction between proteins, peptides, and amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks. You bond or string together some amino acids and you create a peptide. You could create a dipeptide, which is two amino acids strung together, or a tripeptide, which would be three amino acids strung together, all the way up to many amino acids strung together, creating large peptides called polypeptides. And then these polypeptides get folded and oriented in a specific shape, and you can build a full protein. So pretty much you go from amino acid to peptide to protein. But why would I take the time to explain this? Well, based on what we've talked about so far, you may have already got the idea that you cannot absorb a full protein or even a polypeptide. It first must be broken down into smaller peptides and amino acids before it can even come close to getting absorbed through the small intestine and eventually into the bloodstream. But what we can absorb are very small peptides like dipeptides and tripeptides and obviously in individual amino acids. And this is going to be very important in just a second when we talk about if the type of protein you eat even matters and if you have any control on where these proteins can be distributed throughout your body. But let me actually finish up getting these small peptides and amino acids absorbed. The small intestine is the longest part of the digestive tract and can be over 20 feet long. And with this particular dissection, we're only showing a portion of that small intestine. But the reason why it's so long is because it is the main area of absorption. And longer means we have more time and length to absorb nutrients. 
Not only does the small intestine have length, but it also has increased surface area due to the tunicum mucosa having folds called circular folds. And you can see these folds that I'm tracing with the probe right here. Now, if we were to zoom in to these circular folds, we would also see that on top of the folds, they would have microvilli, which would further increase the surface area for absorption. And I've got to show you another structure on another cadaver dissection that is super cool and relates to absorption. As I'm holding up this portion of the small intestine, you can see this yellowy tissue called mesentery. But if you look closely, you can see a ton of blood vessels in there that are going to be absorbing all of these nutrients. And in this case, those nutrients are the amino acids that we've been talking about. And here's how this would work. The amino acids and the dipeptides and tripeptides will move from the lumen, which is just the hollow space inside the intestine, and they will move from this lumen and into the cells that are a part of the tunica mucosa. And here's something that's interesting. Any dipeptides or tripeptides that are now in these mucosal cells will get broken down further into amino acids. So now all the protein that we initially ingested has been broken down into amino acids. And some of those amino acids won't even leave the mucosal cells because those mucosal cells will use some of those amino acids to construct cellular proteins that they may need for themselves. But the majority of the amino acids that are not incorporated into those cellular proteins will then move from the mucosal cells and into the bloodstream, and then go directly to the liver. The liver has a huge role in monitoring the supply of amino acids and dictating which amino acids will be transported to the tissues. And after a protein-containing meal, over 50% of the amino acids absorbed will be found in and utilized by the liver. And then the rest will be released as free amino acids into the systemic circulation and become available for the body tissues. And some of those body tissues are the skeletal muscles that you may have just worked out. So now that we know how this all works, does the protein we ingest even matter? And do we have any control over where the ingested protein ends up within our body? Well, let's answer that second question first. Do we have any control where the ingested protein ends up? And the answer is no, not so much. Let's say we ingest some whey protein or maybe even a collagen supplement as collagen is a protein. We know that we can't absorb either one of those until it gets broken down or digested into the amino acids. And it's not like before we ingest that whey or that collagen that we can have this moment of silence and internally tell our body, hey, the amino acids that make up this whey are earmarked for my biceps. That's the only place they can go. Or the amino acids that make up this collagen are earmarked for the skin of my face. That's the only place they can go. No, our body doesn't care where we want those amino acids to go. We even saw that when amino acids are absorbed into the mucosal cells of the small intestine, some of those get taken and utilized by those cells. And then all the rest first go to the liver, and then the liver utilizes over 50% of those amino acids to create plasma proteins and other proteins that are important to the functioning of the human body, and may even use some of those for energy. And then the rest can be utilized for the other tissues like muscle, skin, tendons, ligaments, etc. So you can see we don't really have much of a say of whatever protein we ingest, it's going to get distributed where the body wants it. So what this means is that the most important thing that you can do first, if you're concerned with muscle growth and protein synthesis, is to eat enough protein so that there's enough amino acids available to circulate and be utilized by your muscles and other tissues. And this is where you can get into something that's known as nitrogen balance. Nitrogen balance is the difference between total nitrogen intake and total nitrogen loss. Nitrogen intake comes from protein intake and nitrogen loss comes from the breakdown of proteins throughout the body. So when intake is equal to loss, a state of nitrogen balance exists. When intake is greater than loss, a person is in positive nitrogen balance. But when loss is greater than intake, this would result in a negative nitrogen balance. And nitrogen balance is fluctuating throughout the day. Exercise and feeding obviously play a role in this, but again, overall, you would want to try to be in a positive nitrogen balance in order to consistently build muscle. And finally, does the type of protein you eat even matter? Well, that depends on a few variables. Often you hear about whey and casein as some of the main protein powders that are available for supplementation. And these are derived from milk, which means these are animal proteins. Animal proteins are termed complete proteins because they contain all the indispensable amino acids in the proper amounts and proportions. 
which would prevent amino acid deficiencies. By comparison, plant proteins may lack one or more of the indispensable amino acids or the proper concentrations and are therefore sometimes referred to as incomplete proteins. Now this doesn't mean that someone that is vegan or vegetarian can't get all the indispensable amino acids they need, they just may have to get a little bit more creative and get them from multiple sources. And as an FYI, indispensable amino acids are amino acids that must be provided by the diet because the body can't synthesize them on its own. And these used to be commonly referred to as essential amino acids. And something else to consider about the type of protein that you ingest is how fast it can be digested and absorbed. Whey protein, for example, is known to be broken down and absorbed quickly. So wouldn't this also mean that the type of protein you ingest is important? Well, in certain situations, yes. But let me go back to something I said earlier. First, the most important thing you can do is ingest enough protein. Get in positive nitrogen balance. It is more important to get enough protein in a 24-hour period than it is to worry about the exact timing, the rate of absorption, and making sure you get that whey protein shake right after you exercise. Now, how much protein depends on various factors and can range anywhere from 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, depending on your goals. But we do have a video where we get into the amount of protein needed in great detail, so I will link that to this video. But once we get to that optimal amount of protein during a 24-hour period, then yeah, if you're concerned about recovering as quickly as possible, let's start looking at optimizing the timing of protein ingestion and might as well get the potential benefits of ingesting the fast absorbing protein right after a workout to help start reversing the catabolic state of those recently exercised muscles. And may as well also start replenishing your glycogen stores while you're at it by mixing some of that protein with some carbohydrates, which we should probably talk about how those carbohydrates are also broken down and absorbed, but in a different video. So hopefully you learned some cool information about how our bodies digest, absorb, and utilize proteins. And like I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in learning more about how much protein you need, we'll link that video here. And if you want to check out Iverstore, we've got that information in the description below. And if you want to move a little bit further, I'll meet you down in the comments.